Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to the Open Garden with Carolyn Dorsch. By the end of this presentation, you will have learned something from Carolyn's experiment with straw bale gardening. First, some housekeeping items. So please use the chat box for your questions. They will be fielded at one point during the presentation and at the end by Maggie Ma, our chat monitor today. Thank you, Maggie, and everyone else on the Zoom support team today, and that includes Laura Majerus, Kathy Trafton, and Jeffrey Blake. At the end of the presentation, we will open up the meeting for general conversation with the aim of closing by 2.15. So now I'd like to introduce master gardener and master composter, Carolyn Dorsch. Carolyn is a 2020 graduate. This means she was part of the first ever fall training that started in September of 2019. And she graduated in January of 2020, just before the pandemic. The training class was held at various locations, including the San Carlos Library, where, as you know, we were working on the native plant and herb garden there. And because of her strong background and deep knowledge of natives, Carolyn was encouraged by the project team to stop by and see what they were up to. Well, she started volunteering there before she even graduated. And she is now part of the leadership team for that project. And she has been involved in other activities and presentations too. So she has really hit the ground running and we are very fortunate to have Carolyn as part of our community. So please take it away, Carolyn. Wow, that's uh, very nice. Thank you very much, Peggy. And I wanna thank um, everyone that's here, came to attend. I really appreciate it. Here we are Saturday afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna do my open garden. Can't do it in person, so we're doing it virtually. And um, the, there will be slides available afterwards. So they'll be available through the Master Gardeners. At some point, they'll be set up. But if you want them sooner, you can just contact me and I can feel happy to send them off to you. So um, next slide. And Laura's running the slides for us, for me. So thank you very much, Laura. So today's program. Um, we're going to talk about straw bale gardening. I guess the, the most important, the, the first thing we should talk about, well, what is it exactly? So we'll I'll get into that. Talk about the pros and cons of straw bale gardening. What can you grow? There might be a few extra supplies you're going to need, so I'll uh, highlight those. Then uh, get into the nuts and bolts of how to set it up. Then we'll take a little break for questions. So if you do have questions, you can put them in the chat. And Maggie uh, Ma is going to be uh, managing the questions in the chat for me. So I really appreciate that. And then after the first questions uh, and answer session, we'll then cover maintenance. There's a little bit, not too much. And then just end of season reflections and how I think it went at the end of the presentation. Then we'll have time, hopefully, for a few more uh, questions. I do have a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to try to go pretty quickly through it so um, Jeffrey doesn't get mad at me for uh, going over time. So. Anyway, next slide. Okay, so the first thing is, well, what is straw bale gardening? Um, probably a lot of you have heard about it, but maybe haven't tried it. So let's just make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Um, so basically, it's growing plants in a conditioned straw bale. And we'll get into what conditioned straw bale means, but keep that in mind. It's growing plants in a conditioned straw bale. And... Um, one of the things that we're gonna need to keep in mind also is when we talk about straw bales, that's what we mean. Straw bales, we're not talking about hay bales. Sometimes people use the term straw and hay, inter hay interchangeably, but they are very distinct things. So I just wanna be very clear what we're dealing with. Just to, um, just to point out what it's not, the hay bales, hay is a material um, that's either normally grass or alfalfa, forage and it's cut for animal feed. So it has seeds in it, it has leafy materials. Um, the bales are very green. When you see a bale, when you see a big bale and it's green, that's going to be hay and that's going to be feed for animals. Straw, on the other hand, are those beautiful yellow gold uh, bales that you see like in the picture below. So straw is actually the dried stalks or combs of normally a cereal plant like uh, wheat, or rice. 
So the, the crop or the seed grain has been harvested and what's left are those dry stalks that the seed was on. So it's uh, not intended for consumption and it's sold for animals uh, to sleep in or bedding. So very distinct things. Um, the hay bales are gonna be more expensive because they have, it's food for the animals. They're gonna be much heavier. They're gonna be green. They're pretty expensive. Straw bales are gonna be much lighter in weight. They're gonna be dry and um, the different, the gold color. So that's how you can sort of tell. So straw bales are what you see at, uh, in, in decorations and stores and you know, they use straw bales. They didn't ever use hay bales. Hay bales are gonna have a very strong odor because of all those plant material that's inside of them. Okay, so we're talking about straw bales. And the origins of straw bale gardening, well, someone asked me that. It's like, well, you know, they, I, I couldn't find it. There's no date in history that this is when straw bale gardening began. And really what's expected is probably what happened is somebody piled up a bunch of straw, maybe let it go, nothing, you know, wasn't doing anything with the straw. Maybe they had it for their animals put aside. And before you knew it, things started growing out of it. And at some point someone said, hey, uh, we could, you know, plants look like they can grow in a straw bale environment. And so over time, you know, people sort of figured it out and um, it, it, it kind of came into being. I did read that it is actually done commercially in some places that uh, cucumbers are grown in straw bales. So, and maybe when we talk about the advantages of it, maybe we'll figure out why, why would you want to do that? So it's also very similar to container gardening. And you can kind of tell just by looking, right? It almost looks like a container. It's above the ground. It has a, it has a shape. The straw bales are held together by two or three pieces of twine. So we're, you're, as I discuss this, you're gonna say, oh, that sounds a lot like um, uh, container gardening. And you're right, because there are quite a few similarities. Okay, next slide. So I mentioned in the previous slide that straw bale gardening requires um, conditioned straw bales. So I'm going to talk right now about what, the, what do I mean by conditioning. And a little bit later in the presentation, I will discuss the steps to how to actually do it. But I just want you to be kind of thinking up front, you know, why we have to go through this process. Why can you not stick plants directly in a straw bale when you bring it home? And um, so let's get into this. So conditioning is basically preparing it so you have a nice medium for the plant medium for the plants to grow in. Straw bales have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio and it can range anywhere from 40 to one or 100 to one. So um, it, you know it's like the browns when you talk about composting greens and browns well these are the browns. Now we know to grow vegetables and flowers herbs they they're going to need some nitrogen a more nitrogen rich environment. So the optimal growing conditions are going to be in a, in a um, more nitrogen rich environment. So they're going to want a 25 or 30 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you have a disconnect right from the very beginning, right? The bales don't have enough nitrogen to grow food or uh, flowers or whatever in. So you're going to have to change that environment within the bale to create those optimal growing conditions. And that's what basically what conditioning is doing. It's converting it from a a high carbon sort of inert thing, this dry straw bale into a nice hospitable environment that you can put your plants in. And the way to achieve that is by adding nitrogen fertilizer and water. And it it's takes about two weeks uh, process. Every day you're adding water and or nitrogen fertilizer. Um, at the very end, we do some other fertilizers in there, but you basically want that straw bale to be in the condition that you can grow plants. Um, it does sound like composting because it basically is composting. And as you know, one way to know composting is happening is the temperature is going to rise. And sure enough, we're going to see that the temperature is going to go up because the microorganisms, once you hit the bales with water, their microorganisms are going to come to life and they're going to start to try to break down uh, the straw and into something that the plants are eventually going to like. But we're going to need to add nitrogen because there's just not enough nitrogen in the bales and the microorganisms are gonna be consuming nitrogen initially to help break things down. So I hope that makes sense, but that's what conditioning is to get it from uh, a kind of a high carbon to nitrogen ratio to the more optimal ratio that we want for our plants. Okay, next slide. 
So I'm gonna discuss, there's lots of advantages to straw bale gardening. I probably could have made six slides and just kept running the list, but um, I'll just highlight some of them, but there are sure are plenty of them. Um, one that's high on the list is you really don't have any soil issues, right? The bales are on the ground, that's fine, but they're, uh, you know, the, you, when you have plants in the ground, you have soil issues. You might have pathogens or um, the soil quality itself might not be, it might be, it just might not be um, hospitable for plants to grow in. And that means you might have to prepare the soil if you're growing plants in the ground. If you're growing them in straw bales, then you don't have to worry about what the soil is underneath. So that's a big issue. On that in that same vein, there's no tilling or digging required. Uh, there's fewer weeds and pests. That's just and my observation as well from having done it. And um, yeah, pests were not a, a problem, you know, no insect pests or um, yeah, I just didn't have a problem with pests other than the furry kind, which we'll talk about. I like that it's the raised height, easier access. So that's a lot like a container gardening. If you have something in a container or a raised bed, right, it's a lot easier to get to. So um, that's the same. You can start your growing season earlier and you can continue the season longer. And the reason for that is because like a raised bed, the temperature in the, in the medium is going to be warmer than in the soil itself. And um, you'll see later how the, the straw bales are much warmer and it, early on, once I get them conditioned, than the soil temperatures were. And likewise, you can catch the end of the season and maybe plant, have plants a little bit later than you would directly in the ground. For people that live in the northern states, this is a really big deal. And one of the books that I used a lot for my um, project was, a, was written by a man who lives in Minnesota. So you can imagine a place like that, the fact that you could expand your growing season is a huge thing for the northern states. The other thing is you can't overwater it because it's going to go right through and you're going to, you know, you're going to see the water if it's coming out the bottom. So that, that's a nice thing. You don't know, there's no overwatering happening. Crop rotation is not an issue, just like the, the, the soil issues associated with um, why you would want to do crop rotation, you don't have to worry about. That's, that's, not, um, that's not critical. Um, sometimes we also do crop rotation when the soil gets depleted, but again, we don't have to worry about that. And then at the end, the end of the season, um, you have beautiful compost, uh, compost material, stuff that you can work with afterwards. So, you know, you, it's, it's all used up at the end. So those are, I think, are some of the advantages, and there are quite a few more, but those are the ones that were most important to me. Okay, next slide. Well, it uh, wouldn't be right if I didn't think about, you know, okay, what were the disadvantages? And I had to kind of put my thinking cap on, because like, I don't know what they were, but then, uh, you know, uh, in the, I had, so I even Googled it. Well, what are some of the disadvantages? And it, the consensus is that it uses more water. So I, I guess, you know, especially being here in a drought, maybe that's a consideration that I should be thinking more of. First of all, I don't think it's using that much. I mean, I had just nine bales and I talked to Michael and my partner about it. And he said, you know, but you can't overwater them. And I might overwater in the garden and not really know it. So I thought, well, that's a good point. You know, if you're not really careful when you're watering your garden, how do you know you put enough water in, but in the bales, you know. So I didn't feel like I really used that much more water than a traditional garden, but uh, people out there do think that happens. More fertilizers in the, more fertilizer is needed. I think that's true because I wouldn't go through all that alfalfa stuff, um, fertilizer that you're going to hear about coming up um, with the conditioning, you know, but you do use fertilizer in your regular garden as well. So I don't think that's a big deal, but I'm, like I said, I'm trying to come up with the disadvantages. The bales, you have to buy them. So normally um, they could be expensive. So, you know, that could be a uh, consideration. And then maybe the biggest one really is, okay, <laughs> I want to do this. How do I get those bales home? So, you know, you got to find a way to get them home. You know, find a friend with a truck, right? Okay, next slide. So um, there are a few things that you are not recommended for straw bale gardening. So I just want to bring those up in front. So don't think about that using these um, if you're going to do straw bale gardening. The tall plants, that kind of makes sense. Even like a, any container, you wouldn't want to put something too tall in it because you just wouldn't be able to reach it. So, um, so I, I definitely stay away from that. Um, perennial vegetables are not going to be a good idea either because the straw bales are just going to be a single season um, 
phenomenon. <laughs> they're, they're not gonna last like a container could last for years and years. So you definitely wouldn't want things like artichokes, asparagus, Jeruz Jerusalem artichokes, stuff like that. And likewise, perennial herbs, uh, rosemary and sage that can get to be pretty big and deep, syst deep root systems. I wouldn't put those in there. I might put some of the others like, you know, dill or um, basil, which can overwinter. So you could think of them as a perennial, but, but none of the big heavy perennials, I wouldn't do those. So next slide. And so what can you grow in a straw bale? Well, basically everything else. I, I think, I didn't try everything else, but I think everything else can, can do well in a straw bale. So you gotta just give it a try. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about um, getting started, um, my considerations to get started and some of the supplies that I needed. All right, next slide. Uh, site issues. Well, as we learned in all of our master gardener training, you know, we learned about how to analyze a site. So here is this beautiful site. Um, so that's supposed to be my aerial view of my house on the right. And probably um, what might stand out for you, and it certainly stands out for me, is there's a lot of trees in that aerial view. And that is the case. There are uh, coast live oaks all over. And then um, on the slide on the left, which shows the actual space I ended up using, which is the side of the house. Um, the neighbors have a very tall 15 foot hedge. I've got a fig tree in, a, in the back of that picture on the left and in the forefront, there's an orange tree. So, you know, there's a lot of shade issues. And at first I wasn't quite sure if I'd be able to use this, um, but I went out and monitored the sunlight on a regular basis. And I realized I do have six plus hours of sunlight, which is what you really need for a vegetable garden. So I realized that this was gonna work in spite of all the, the shade that comes and goes in the yard. This was sort of an unused side area, you know, things were stored there, things were sort of dumped there. So it's, if I did wanna grow things in the ground, I'd really have to do a lot of work to get it prepared. And by doing straw bale gardening, I wouldn't have to worry about the weeds, the compacted soil, I could just, get the straw bales in and, and, and go running with it. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, it is facing uh, south, southwest to north, northeast, the, um, where that section that I ended up um, doing the gardening. And normally it's recommended to face uh, north, south for your bales. So I was pretty, pretty close, you know, uh, 21 degrees off or something, but I was pretty close to the, um, what they recommend. So like I said, I think I got enough sun. So that, that all worked out. Okay, next slide. So this is a list of supplies. Um, sorry if it's kind of small. And um, the things near the top are things I actually use. And then near the bottom are just other useful supplies or alternatives. You know, I was thinking about it. The only things you really need are, you know, two things. You need the bales, right? And uh, you want clean and weed-free bales. And you, then you're gonna need the, um, the fertilizers, the, the nitrogen fertilizers and some of the other fertilizers. Everything else, you know, you can use or not like you would use or not in your garden. I did a soaker hose, I think is definitely something you'd wanna have because it just lends itself to laying a soaker hose on it and watering, but everything else is just sort of up to your preferences and what you decide to grow. Okay, next slide. So as I mentioned, I did start with nine straw bales and um, these bales were uh, wheat bales and I think most of the time when you get a bale, it's going to be wheat. The, I, the only other bale I've seen is rice bales, and I've requested them when I wanted one, but it's just the typical run-of-the-mill bale is just a, you know, was from, from a wheat uh, that had been harvested, and this is what's left, the chaff. I got these, um, I got these in November, so I, bought, I got these for free at a pumpkin patch right after Halloween, and um, so I got them for free, and I was able to get them home. So I was real happy about that. But you know, I had to store them for uh, five months and before spring to get them. And so I had some issues with that. If, you know, so if you were gonna do it, you might just wanna get them in March or April when you're about ready to get started. These bales, by the way, uh, there's different size bales, but they're 14 inches by 18 inches by 40 inches, two twine. Uh, it, you just want a big bale. You know, you don't want those little decorative bales at Michael's or something. You want something that's going to be pretty good size. So you're going to be putting your plants in. It's really nice height though to work with. Okay, next slide. And just to show you the bales, as I said, I had them for five months and this is how I stored them. I brought them home. 
so happy to get them in that side yard. And there they sat for five months. And um, I didn't think to cover them for the winter weather. If you go out driving in the Midwest, maybe even out on the coast, you see you see uh, straw bales that are covered up for you know weather, but I didn't think about it. So I did run into some issues that they got heavier than if, if they had been kept dry and that made them a little harder to move around. And they were also a little bit looser, um, you know, because they started breaking down a little bit. So that's why they're not all pretty gold colored when I first laid them out and I have some are dark and some are light depending on where they were in this you know, heat for five months. Okay, next slide. So I did use a few uh, items. So hardware cloth, which is on the left, is, is just a wire mesh, like a half inch uh, squares. And I put I used it to put underneath the bales, underneath the long rows, because occasionally a gopher shows up in the yard and I didn't want a gopher coming up through the straw bale. It doesn't mean that I can't have a gopher problem. You know, they can come around, but I just figured it would help. So I, ran, I did that. And then I did use this 14 gauge wire, which is just a great weight of wire um, for anything in your garden. It's strong. So if you're doing trellising, it's pretty good, but it's not so strong that you, I, I can't manipulate it with my hands or fingers. I think the next size gauge was, was too stiff, you know, for me to actually be able to manipulate with just my bare hands. So for, anyway, 14 gauge, pretty good stuff. Next slide. I mentioned I did use some fertilizers and the nitrogen source is the most important fertilizer that you're going to need. And I decided, you know, I want to have it organic because I'm growing food. Um, so I bought, it took me a while to find the organic nitrogen fertilizer. And it's because it was lawn for, it's, what, it's in the lawn care section and I don't have a lawn. So, oh, okay. So promotes plush lawns and gardens, as you can see. It's mostly alfalfa is what is, is you can tell on the left. It's like uh, alfalfa pellets, but that's really high nitrogen. So I bought that. And then next slide, I also bought uh, chicken manure. So um, one of the things said you could use chicken manure and a, a, a nitrogen fertilizer, just mix them 50-50 as your nitrogen source. So I decided to, to do that. So I got chicken manure and uh, that became my nitrogen source. And next slide. And as I did mention, we, uh, there are a few more fertilizers that are gonna need to be added just once at the end of the conditioning uh, schedule. So you need a phosphorus and a potassium source. So I, these are things I always have around the house anyway, or the garden. So I, I use bone meal and seaweed, seaweed extract for that day 10 conditioning that I'll show you in a little bit. Next slide. Okay, so preparing the bale. So it's um, positioning them and then, and then getting them conditioned. So let me show you how that, how that went out. So next slide. So this is just uh, you know, starting to get the bales uh, off that big heap and, and just trying to lie, lie them out. As you can see that hardware cloth, that long strip of uh, metal mesh, that's that what I measured it beyond you know, the length of the bales. I did one side was five and one was four bales. And so that mesh is gonna go underneath and then the bales are gonna be put on top of it. Next slide. I also, there's see, there's me working in the yard. <laughs> A lot of times I took pictures of Michael. And so I was like, that doesn't look like I did any work, but I, I did. <laughs> so I'm working on getting the, um, the soaker hose put on top of the uh, bales. It's recommended that you do the soaker hose before you do the conditioning, which we'll come up to shortly, but I thought I'd do it afterwards. So that's what I did. I, as you can also see in the picture, I put up some T posts at the very ends of the bales, optional, but it's kind of recommended. And then I used that wire, uh, 14 gauge wire to, to run uh, uh, between the, the T posts for future trellising. Also, if you want to put a cover or something over the, the uh, plants for any reason, you have something to hang it on. So I did that. Uh, yeah. Next slide. I got it all set up. And um, yeah, yeah there's, that's just more, you can see the soaker hose a little bit better. And I, so I dug a trench between the two bales to just run it across and then down the next row. So next slide. Okay, so the bales, as I've mentioned, have to be conditioned before the, um, the plants can be put in it. We have to create that, um, that, ho that environment that will have the more nitrogen rich and start breaking down so the plants can be in it. So the book I have has a chart, tells you every day what you need to do and um, 
how much you need to add. And since I'm doing, there are different schedules for non-organic and organic, and you know, I went with the organic. So here's the organic schedule. So as you can see, I basically every day for 10 days, I was doing something. And most of it is adding nitrogen. So I'm, so this is per bale, I would have to add like on day one, let's just look at three cups of nitrogen fertilizer. So I'm mixing up that, that lawn fertilizer and the chicken manure fertilizer, like one and a half cups of each, mixing them up. And then I would sprinkle them on the uh, bale and then we would water it to saturate. And water, I mean, the, for initially it takes a lot of water because the bales are dry in theory. So I'm getting, I'm putting the water in and really trying to get it to penetrate down into, um, into the bale and those, that nitrogen that's on the top to kind of work its way down into the bale. So um, you, that's mostly nitrogen fertilizer all the way through the schedule. You, you do skip days occasionally, but you're always making, every day you're going out to make sure it's watered and watered to the point where you see the water coming out the bottom. And like I say, once you start watering it, um, you know, it starts heating up. And um, it does mention warm water in the middle. I didn't do that because I just, I'm, I'm not gonna heat water up <laughs> to do it. It's just not gonna happen. But, you know, here maybe warm water is, is a different issue if you're in Minnesota in April versus here in California. So I think I didn't have any problems. Day 10, I added uh, the phosphorus and um, potassium as, as they mentioned, and then I wash that in and then that's it. And then you just let them, you just basically wait at least five days before you're gonna do any planting. So it's about a two week process from the point you get started to probably when you can put your plants in. Okay, next slide. And just showing a couple pictures, that's, there's Michael dutifully putting in uh, some of the alfalfa pellets it looks like. And you can see on the right, it's very green looking, all that alfalfa on top. And, and you really want the water to penetrate through it and help it work its way down into the bale. Next slide. And there he is uh, washing it in and you know, kind of using a little bit of a power uh, thing to do it. He, it. It was a rainy day, I believe. So he's wearing a raincoat, but, it, but um, I would not rely on the weather to take care of it. Make sure that it, he, you know, we, we did it and made sure it got fully saturated. Okay, next slide. And as I said, the bales are cooking. Uh, at this point, um, I think that was maybe one of my highest temperatures, 125, 128, something like that. It did get pretty high. Um, and at that point, the soil was about 50 degrees outside. If I were to, you know, growing something in the ground and here my bales are at 120. So, you know, things are happening when you see that happening. And, and I did the thermometer test at 14 inches in depth. I did also a seven inch depth, but I think the 14 is going to be more reflective of where the roots are going to be. So, okay, next slide. And I, you know, because it's a, a, a CE thing, right? We got to have a slide of a chart. So here you go. Um, so just to show the, the, what the daily temperature was, I, I thought, oh, it'd be fun to take temperature. I've got a compost thermometer after all, got to put it to use. So I think it's interesting. I think the bales had different highs and lows. And I think it's because of the way they had been stored and some that were looser had, you know, had different temperatures than the ones that were nice, tight and compact. So I thought it was pretty interesting, but you can see you know, at first nothing's happening and then, and then it, starts, it starts cooking pretty fast and then it starts tapering down. And that, that's, the, that's what you would expect. Okay, next slide. So there, I'm, I'm now ready to plant. I have done the two week cycle. I've let it rest for at least five days and I'm ready to plant. And I actually, I think I started um, about April, I think around April 10th is when I started the conditioning. So it should have been ready to plant around the 25th, 27th. I actually didn't get my planting in until about middle of May. And while I was waiting to plant, I, I would still go out and just, I would water the bales every few days just to keep them moist and keep them continuing to cook. But I had not put up all the, all the hardware beforehand. So I had to do that. And so it took me a little while. And, um, but I'm, anyway, I was finally ready to plant. Let me show you next slide, uh, what I actually decided. So I have nine bales and uh, the books tell you how many plants per bale. And it's not very many, it's like two or three, depending on the size of the plant. You don't just, you know, for, I guess if you put in things like, you know, radishes or little bunch onions, you could put a lot more in, but for traditional, you know, like tomatoes, cucumbers, things like that, it's just a couple, one or two, you know, uh, of each or two or three of each. So 
you know, I, I uh, anyway, this is what I planted, just typical summer veggies. I wanted to try a bunch of different things. I tried different tomatoes, um, potatoes. You always heard about potatoes growing in straw bales. So I definitely had to do potatoes. So, um, so that's what I do. With the potatoes, you actually plant the eye. And so it said three potatoes per um, bale. So that's what I did. And, you, and those you actually put in deep. Um, so yeah, next slide. All right. Oh, and I forgot to mention I, at the ends of each bales, I did put in some uh, some plants either in containers or some flowers just to add a little color, but also to bring in pollinators. And I just took advantage of those ends where I had some lines so I could put like pole beans or something at the end, actually in the ground. So yeah, these are just some seedlings. It looks like on the left, we've got some basil. I tried some bush beans. The middle, the tomatoes were really spindly when I put them in, but they, they did fill out. And then on the far right is the, uh, our, I think those were cucumbers that were planted and those did pretty well. So I put in all seedlings. Um, you can do seeds. And I didn't do it because um, it just was going to be a little fussier. But if you do want to do seeds, like you want to try radishes or just start something from seed, you need to put a layer of potting mix on top of a conditioned bale and then um, put the seeds in and then a little bit of soil uh, potting mix on top and then, you know, keep it moist, just like you would in a regular garden. And I just, it was a little fussier, you know, you can't let it dry out. And I thought I'd save that for another time. So I used all seedlings. And then when I put these seedlings in, you know, you have to kind of part the, um, the straw bale and then you can jam it in there. I put a little compost or a little bit of uh, potting mix in, in the hole itself. And sometimes I had to actually pull the straw out because it was, the plant was a little too big and just put a little potting mix in and get the plant in and then just stuff it back with um, the straw. Next. Uh, yeah, just more things uh, planted. Uh, yeah, on the left, those were actually the potatoes that started coming up. So this was after the initial planting next to a basil. I don't know if they belong together, but I just, I was sort of frustrated that nothing was in that, nothing was coming up in that bale. So I stuck a, a basil plant there and only two of my three uh, potatoes came up. So I was pretty disappointed about that. I think I should have put more in and I could always take some out if it got to be too many. And then on the right, I had some strawberries I put in and I, ended, I had put some covering over them because I knew that the critters would love to go after my strawberries. Okay, next slide. All right, and then I put in some, I always like colorful um, plants that are gonna attract pollinators. And again, this, this side yard had sort of been abandoned. Not much, nothing was really growing in it. So I've got veggies in the, around the corner and other things happening. So I really wanted to make sure the, the, all the good critters knew that, hey, there's stuff happening over here. So I actually put uh, poppies, cosmos, and bee plant, and then some herbs, letting them go to flower, brought them around to the ends of the straw bales. So, and actually I put the cosmos in the, some of the straw bales sides as well, just to sort of draw them in. And as you can see, they, yeah, they, they found, they, they're good, they find them. Next. So this is just an early look of what it looked like. Things have been put in the ground. Um, I'm sorry, things have been put in the bales. In the forefront were some beans I just put in the ground since I had some kind of trellising there. Uh, so this is uh, one view. And then the next slide is gonna be the next slide. It's just the same, same thing, same view, still kind of early on, uh, not harvesting anything yet. I've got some pots in front of those uh, other straw, the other ends of the straw bales with some of those flowering plants that I was talking about. So now I think is a good time to take a break for any questions. I'll be doing maintenance and kind of last thoughts after this first question session. But uh, Maggie, if there's, were there any questions or comments? We do have one question from Stu Dalton. Um, he wants to know if you considered using alfalfa pellets. Uh, he says he uses these on flowers and vegetables. Um, yeah, great question, Stu. And in a sense, I what I, that uh, lawn fertilizer is primarily alfalfa. The thing about the pellets, um, you know, because you want them to get down into the, you want, when you're conditioning the bales, you want them, you want the pellets to get down into uh, the bale. So it'll be more effective conditioning from inside than on the top. It's a little harder to get into. So I think alfalfa meal, basically take the pellets and mash them down. So it's a little bit more powdery. Actually, when I opened the, um, the lawn fertilizer, 
when I found, you know, found the, the organic nitrogen source and it turned out to be lawn fertilizer, right? I opened it and like, it, it looked like alfalfa pellets, you know, it was sort of a mix of alfalfa pellets and alfalfa meal. So I just kind of laughed like, oh, of course, alfalfa. So yeah, I think that is the primary, um, that, that really is the primary nitrogen source to use. Uh, so yeah, I, it's, it's, it's just fantastic in the garden. It just really um, pumps up the nitrogen very quickly. So yeah, I basically did use it, but it's just more in a meal form than pellets. So a follow a follow up um, first. Uh, Stu would like to know if it's possible for you to is it could you soak the pellets beforehand and make a mash? Yeah, I um, think that's a yeah. Actually, that's a great idea. Yeah, that, that and I think that's probably a good way to handle it anyway in your garden. And you could do that. And then you just have to you know it's basically three cups per bale you know on those scheduled days. And then you could just sort of lay it all out, but just, and then you just use the water to get it in there. So I didn't have to go out and buy lawn fertilizer. Now I know I could have just bought organic alfalfa pellets, right? I guess the one thing is alfalfa pellets are often an animal food. And sometimes they have vitamins and other things. They may have honey and, you know, molasses. They may have other things in them. So I think if you are going to use them, you want to make sure you're using, you know, you don't need those additional things. Probably wouldn't cause any harm, but no need to pay for things you don't need. Just get, you know, pure raw alfalfa pellets. Um, uh, Lisa Erdos has a question. Um, she wants to know if you could set up the bales in late March or early April to take advantage of late rains. Yeah, I think so. That would be, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, Lisa. I mean, mine did get some advantage, I think, because they'd just been sitting out, but they were sitting out in a pile instead of all laid out. Um, I definitely think that's the case. It would work out. I don't think you'd have to worry too much about them over overcooking that by the time you got started, the bales are already falling apart. I mean, you know, the bales will start breaking down as they decompose from within and you want to sort of shore it up. I have an, I have an extra straw bale like in a corner. So if I needed more straw because it started sort of collapsing on itself, I could push it in there. But I think, I actually think that's a pretty neat idea to have them all already ready to start, you know, benefiting from the, from those spring rains and, um, and then you can just start conditioning them. You know, I, I waited almost uh, three or four, three weeks after they were fully conditioned before I started planting in them. So, yeah, I think, I think you could definitely use the benefit of mother nature as well. Um, so when you did saturate, it would saturate really quickly. I don't think you'd have a problem. Okay. Uh, Naomi Meyer um, uh, has a question that perhaps the loose bales had a higher temperature because they were getting more air, question mark. Uh, that could be, I honestly, the loose one, I think the loose ones were the ones that were exposed, I think the ones that were on the outer section of my pile. So they were the ones that had, uh, yes, had started to decompose. So I think part of it was that they, they got more weathering, like Lisa's idea of, you know, putting them out in the rain, they were getting more of that rain. So, so they had actually started the decomposition process. They were heavier, right? And uh, so um, they probably did get more air because once they start decomposing, you know, there's kind of cracks in it and you can, and air will get in more. So it's kind of a combination. They got more moisture, they got more air, you know, so, so they started, uh, yeah. So the, the, the temperatures, um, the temperatures were high. Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Yes, uh, we do. Um, Peggy Lynch wants to know if straw bales get moldy. Yeah, sure. I mean, they can. Uh, I think I've got a picture of, I had some mushrooms start, pro once they started getting wet and things started happening, mushrooms did come up. I mean, that's a fungus, but um, I think it, like anything in nature, uh, yeah, once you introduce, um, you know, I'm introducing alfalfa and water and, and you know, the right temperature, it, it's, you know, it was pretty cool in the, in the uh, spring. So I didn't, I mean, there might've been molds, but they weren't, they weren't obvious. I did see some, some fungus. I, I don't know, I think of mold, I think of it more as a warm season thing that I experience in my yard. I mean, I know it's in the cool weather as well. I didn't notice any mold issues, um, but sure. I, I think any living plant material could get, get moldy, yeah. Um, Naomi Meyer would like to know if you, if you used more amendments overall than if you'd planted a traditional garden. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had to, um, I had to get the calculator out to figure out how much am I going to need? I had nine bales, three cups, 
you know, I, eight days. I mean, the whole thing. So all that alfalfa for sure, or the, the you know, the nitrogen. Um, so I, I did use more because I, ha I had to create, I had to add nitrogen to make the environment right. I mean, but this is in lieu of if I grow something in a container, I'll go out and buy, um, you know, potting soil, right? And that's so it's sort of a trade-off, you know, the potting soil already has all of those uh, nutrients in it. So I would go out and like, I'll, I'll, I'll refresh my uh, containers every year when I put like tomatoes in containers or cucumbers. So, um, so I did, yeah, I definitely did use more, but um, I don't think too much, you know, again, not too much more. And, you know, the, the, these are pretty inexpensive fertilizers too, I must say. So, um, yes. Um, uh, someone would like to know what the maximum number of crops you can grow per bale might be and what starter size is best to use. Okay, well, I think this starter size for a bale is pretty good. Again, it's like 14 by 18 by 40. So I like the 40, you know, 40 inch length is really nice. It just depends what you're growing. Most things like tomato plants, you'd put two per bale. If you were going to grow eggplant, you could do three is recommended. Um, if you were growing, I'm trying to think small things like, you know, like bunching onions or, you know, li little things like that, you could probably grow like uh, 16 in a row and have two or three rows. So it just totally depends on, uh, on what you're putting in it. But uh, two is like the minimum or, you know, for, for the, for the big plants, you're going to, two would be, I guess the maximum, sorry, the maximum that you'd put in. If you had a zucchini and a cucumber, you know, you'd, that'd just be two. You wouldn't try to put six or seven in. I think with the potatoes, I think I'd try more. I mean, I was disappointed with the yield at the end. So, um, uh, but I, I tried to kind of stick to the books, you know, do what was recommended and, and then see the result. Another question from Naomi uh, Meyer is, would you do it again? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The best part was it was fun. You know, I loved looking at it. I just, I, I, I mean, it's not probably everybody's cup of tea, but I just really enjoyed it. It was just a lot of fun. You know, we, we already have so many gardening skills that we bring to the table and you got to use those gardening skills that you know and composting skills that you know, but you're sort of applying it to like a new fact pattern and it's just fun and it's a challenge and it's, it's interesting what works and it's very interesting what doesn't work, you know? So um, I would love to do it again. I, I, I work on my setup a little bit better, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to do it again. Um, she also wants to know if the condition of the bales uh, influenced what you planted in them. It did. And I, so this was done in 2020. So it wasn't this year. Um, so I, it's so, I thought a lot about <laughs> the temperatures of the bales and how much sun they got because the ones at the very back, like where the potatoes got a little more shade than the eggplant, which I know likes a lot of sun and the cucumbers. So between the sun conditions and then looking at the bales that seemed to run a hotter and the, the ones that seemed like they were more broken down, I, I thought about it, but it probably wouldn't have made a difference, you know. I, I did think about it, but I, I don't know that it, it would have made any sort of difference. But, um, but it, you know, if I'd used all, it would be interesting if I used all the same bales, I got them all at the same time, laid them all out. I think, you know, the temperatures wouldn't have fluctuated quite as much as they did. And, and then it would be more of a controlled situation, except for the lighting is still an issue. Um, okay. Um, Cindy would like to know if you had a rodent problem and also would like to know how long the bales last. Okay, great questions. Thank you, Cindy. And um, yeah, I did have the rodent problem, which is going to come up in maintenance shortly. So we'll, we'll get, we'll cross that bridge. And um, the bales, I think just how long did they last is her question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it's really a single season thing. So it's only going to last one growing season. I mean, they, I probably could have put maybe a fall crop in like the, you know, a little, uh, some of them, they weren't deteriorating too much, but you're not, you're not gonna get more than one crop. Maybe you could add some lettuce at the end of the summer and put something like that in there. They do start sort of softening up uh, some more than others. And like I said, I just have extra straw and I just stuff it in there and it worked fine, but um, no more than a single season. And like I said, I'll get to the, the, the critter problem in a second. <laughs> There's one comment from Stu Dalton just at the end here. Um, he says he bought um, a couple of 50 pound bags of 
alfalfa pellets a few days ago. Pure alfalfa, about $20 a piece. And he also says that alfalfa has a natural growth stimulant, tricontinol. Okay, great. So, well, that sounds FYI. Cool. Yeah, it's great. Maybe he can add where he got those too. That's been, that's great. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a, it's a fantastic, uh, inexpensive tool to have in your, you know, yeah. in, your, in your garden with all your other um, amendments. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, uh, the chat box is, is um, currently up to, up to date. So you're, you're good to go. Okay. Thanks so much, Maggie. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. On to the next Next slide, Laura. Yeah, maintenance. So there, you know, it's gardening, right? So we have to talk about maintenance a little bit. So these are some of the things that I had to deal with uh, during the season. So monthly fertilizing, I use fish emulsion and, um, you know, just like any of your heavy feeding vegetable plants that you expect to produce uh, produce for you, you gotta, you gotta give them, gotta give them some fertilizer. So I use fish emulsion it's often not recommended fish emulsion because as we know it's kind of smelly and um, some people talk about you know animals getting into the bales because of the smell well I took my chances and I don't think they were interested they didn't I didn't, that didn't happen for me but in any event you need some sort of uh, fertilizer um, at least once a month some people will do it like a diluted version every week so you're going to have to keep uh, you know feeding it a little bit Obviously, like any garden, whether it's a straw bale or traditional container, if anything's tall or viney, you're going to have to stake it or you know manage it somehow. Looking for pests, uh, uh, netting and protective covering. I yes, I did put netting over some things because I know I've got squirrels in my garden and and um, there's rats in the neighborhood and rats that come visit. So I knew that was going to be a problem. But you got to check the netting. One of the things they recommend in straw bale gardening, which I didn't read the first time around, but in my research <laughs> preparing for this, ah, I didn't read that in the book, but it was in there. When you're when you're putting your protective covering, you, you want it, the best thing is to anchor it to the ground, something firm, not the bale itself, because the bale, you know, will, will so, somewhat soften up over time and the critters can kind of work their way through it. So it would have been better to stake things down straight all the way down to the ground. And I didn't do that. So anyway, keep, you know, like any garden, you got to keep an eye on your, your netting. Uh, the bales I mentioned before, shoring them up. And then there is a little bit of weeding, but it's very, very uh, minute. Next slide. So somebody asked about um, mold. Well, I didn't, like I said, I did not see mold, but um, little mushrooms did come up really quickly after I started um, conditioning them. And that's completely normal. Um, the book says they're not edible. so don't eat them and you can either keep them in or not. I think I just snap them off and just put them somewhere else, but uh, they did come up. And then on the right, you can see um, that is a, a wheat plant. So, you know, if you weren't sure if you had a rice or wheat, th this uh, straw bale, it was wheat. So, so, you know, there's a little bit of seed in the uh, bales and then occasionally a wheat plant would come up and you just, I just pull it right out. So, that really was the extent of the weeding. It wasn't bad at all. I, I did have bindweed in the yard. I didn't realize how much I had until I started working in the yard on a regular basis. So bindweed would try to come up and even though I'd put mulch down and so I would keep after that bindweed because you know you got to keep after it. Next slide. In addition to surprise visitors, uh, Cindy was asking, did I have any critter problems? Well, you know, uh, and the overnight snap, you know, you had to be perfect. I, I grow mini, mini cantaloupes and mini watermelons because, you know, they're shorter days to harvest and I don't have that much sun because of all those trees. So I try to grow the small ones and, you know, overnight, this is what I came out to. So, so yeah, I did have critter problems and I kind of struggled. You might be able to see there's some, there's some wire mesh I tried to put over the plants, but I really, I'm, I'm really weak at putting hardware in the garden in general, and I didn't do too well in that, and look what happened. Okay, next slide. And I mentioned the mini cantaloupes. Yes, they, they call them Minnesota minis. It's a variety of cantaloupe, and even though it's behind the mesh, it's still something got in there overnight. Again, I think this was an overnight thing again. Can't blame the squirrels, but uh, somebody got in there, so that was a problem. And then I had a zucchini plant, and I covered it, but, you know, it started to grow beyond the, um, 
the, the mesh and perhaps I should have harvested it sooner and look at it, it's got a big bite taken out of it. So that's what happens. Okay, next slide. So now it's taking a while, but finally getting close to harvest time. So let me show you what the garden looks like. Thanks, perfect, thanks. Uh, so here it is looking a lot more robust. You can see the plants are much bigger and things are uh, kind of happening. Next slide. This is, I think it's just the same. I, I always try to take two pictures when I go out there. I take one from each side of the garden just to get a sense of it and see how things are coming along. So those tomato plants on the, on the right are tomato plants. And I mean, they're not still super rich and lush, but, but they're, much, they're not as spindly as they were. And they were definitely producing. Next slide. So just gonna show some slides of just, you know, plants growing and yeah, there really were uh, fruit and on the um, on all the plants. So some tomatoes, uh, lemon cucumbers, I really like those and they did really well. Next slide. We had some crookneck squash and uh, more tomatoes. I tend to grow the medium sized tomatoes, some cherry tomatoes and then mostly medium tomatoes, the same issue. I, I, waiting 80 or 90 days for a tomato just is, it's just too much. You know, I just don't have enough sun really. So I, I tend to grow the smaller tomatoes. Next slide. I did get some zucchini. I had uh, and those ones aren't eaten. Um, I had one zucchini plant, and I, I wouldn't do that again because it's just too big of a plant to try to cover up in a straw bale, you know, with with mesh. But I got a couple of nice zucchinis, so that was interesting. And then on the right, egg, the uh, Japanese eggplant. I like those a lot, and those did really well. Next slide. So just some of the summer bounty. Um, so just to show, I really, these, these did come from the straw bales. I think most of these are from the straw bales. And um, I had some friends, uh, Barbara Wilson and Naomi Meir, both came and helped me um, water my garden and take care of it. I had to leave out of town for six weeks unexpectedly in the summer. So they actually came and um, helped out a lot to keep it going and, and harvested when, when needed. So, and next slide. Just some more, you know, who doesn't like uh, looking at garden bounties, just some more great things that came out of the garden. On the right, that's that's my two potato plants. I got five potatoes. <laughs> I think these are Yukon gold because I they look like russets, but I, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't grow russets. So I'm pretty sure they're Yukon golds, but I was really disappointed with two plants and that's all I got. I, I get more plants in the ground. So I want to try it again, but um, I think I, I think I might put like, five plants in a bale, you know, go, go above the recommendation and, and, and try it again. But, um, but they're nice potatoes. <laughs> Next slide. So the season is finally coming to the end. This is October 10th. So I remember I planted about middle of May. So this is about five months later. And you can see, I, you know, some things I took out early, like I took out the watermelon plant and I took out the cantaloupe, you know, when they got ravaged. Um, but you can see that the bales are starting to cut, decline and then you can, the, the soaker hose then doesn't have something to sit on. So, but these I just let go, um, but it's starting, you know, the season is definitely waning. On the left picture, the eggplant's still going strong on the end, so I'm happy about that, but some of the other areas are starting to fall apart. And next slide. So as I was taking things out, I was really interested to see what the root system looked like. You know, how deep do the roots go? And this is just a, uh, I think this is a Juliet tomato. Um, and I, don't, I thought I took a picture of my cucumbers, but the cucumbers for sure, they went into the ground. So the bales were sitting on that wire mesh like, to kind of go for proof half inch square, but then it was on dirt, you know? And so some of the roots did actually go down into the ground. Um, I, I, was found, I thought that was pretty neat to see. So just, just kind of showing how long, you know, the bales were only, I think 18 inches tall. And so these roots are a lot deeper and they, they, were, they weren't winding, they were straight down. Okay, and that's the end of the season. So in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to sort of wrap up my, my thoughts about it. You know, I started with these nine, uh, misfit bales and uh, turned it into, I think, a beautiful garden. I just love, I just love the look of it. I love plants growing out of straw. I thought it a lot of fun and I actually did get some produce out of it. So it wasn't all for naught. I think the, I think the cucumbers and the eggplant and cherry tomatoes, those did really well. Um, I would, next time I would try more, be more herbs and flowers. I didn't do too much. And I think I have a feeling they do really well in this environment. Um, 
I have to work on somehow protecting the plants that are vulnerable to getting eaten by those uh, squirrels and the rats. So I need to work on a better system. I had the strawberries covered up, but if you actually wanted a strawberry, you had to go through this elaborate thing to get your hand in there to get a strawberry out. And that, that doesn't work. So I have to rethink that. The strawberries grew really well in the, in the straw. Um, and then I can just trans I just transplanted them into the regular garden at the end of the season. So every year, you know, I like, I love gardening. I love studying gardening. I like to try something new every year or two, something really different. And um, that's what this was. It was sort of an experiment and an adventure. I'd heard about it. I'd seen a book on it. And so I said, I'm going to do it. Um, I think it helps build up your gardening skills to approach gardening from a sort of a different angle. Because, you know, you find you're using your composting and all the gardening skills we've learned, but it's just applying it to a sort of a different scenario. And I, I think it was really neat. I would do it again for sure. So with that, I think, uh, oh, a couple, so couple more slides just to wanted to um, uh, get my references. And again, these will be available the slides uh, later on. So, but uh, there's one gardening, there's a couple books out there on straw bale gardening. And if, I think if you're going to do it, I recommend that you get a book. This one's at the library, Menlo Park Library. So it's in the San Mateo County system. Anyway, uh, I recommend that. And there's a really nice uh, publication by our UCANR on gardening with straw bales. And it's only four and a half pages, but it sort of gets into the, um, the more the science behind it and how it works. It doesn't get too much into the conditioning details, I don't think, but it was really useful background information for me on you know, uh, the carbon nitrogen uh, issues and, and distinguishing, distinguishing between straw and hay and all that. So it's a real short little publication. Okay, next slide. Oh yeah, acknowledgements. So I want to, again, thank everybody here for attending. I really appreciate you coming, spending your time with me. Um, I want to thank uh, the, the wonderful support staff to, to do this presentation, Jeffrey Blake, Peggy Lynch, Maggie Ma, Laura Majuris, and Kathy Trafton. You know, they make it really easy to do a presentation. So, you know, if you, if you haven't done one before and you're thinking about it, you can reach out to any of these people probably to ask questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but they, they do the heavy lifting for you. So um, don't let that be a barrier, your hesitancy, because we have great support staff here. So I just want to really thank them. And then, um, I, like I mentioned before, I really special thanks to my two friends, Naomi and Barbara, who, who took care of the garden for six weeks over the summer. Without their help, you know, the garden would have just fallen apart. And, and then I also would like to thank Cynthia, our president, Cynthia Nations. She encouraged me to write an article for the Coastal Magazine, which I did, and that was published in the spring of this year, and also to do a presentation. So uh, Cynthia is a real you know, inspiration to kind of get me going and doing something. And last of all, really, again, all of you wonderful master gardeners, I, I watch your presentations and I've met many of you and I've learned a lot from you and I really appreciate it. And you all inspire me to learn, to grow and to share. So thank you all. I think that's it. So I think at this stage, uh, we're gonna close the slides and then put it on uh, view that we can all see each other if we, if we so choose. I think you can put it on gallery view if you wanna see whoever's got their uh, viewing up. And then Maggie, was if there's any more questions in the chat, I'd be yeah. happy to answer them. Yeah. We've got a couple things. Um, uh, first of all, Stu um, Dalton has provided the, the, the source for the alfalfa pellets that he bought, which is the Peninsula Feed Store okay. at 346 El Camino Real in Redwood City. And they load it for you, he says. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then um, uh, someone would like to know if you would try small herbs and a mini bale. Um. Well, I, I would try, I, I think a mini bale, it's just, it might be, it depends how many, you know, cause they come really tiny. I think they're awfully small. Uh, I just don't think there's enough of an environment there. You know, it has to, to cook and to heat up. I think you need a certain amount of volume and I think it might be difficult to get that. You know, there's no harm in giving it a try. Uh, I, I, you know, it's just such a small, uh, small uh, thing that it would probably, when it starts breaking down, there's just not much to it. So. So I guess that would be my main concern, okay. but um, it would be pretty cute though, wouldn't it? To have a, a little yeah. basil and have a basil plant or something coming yeah. out of it. 
Yeah, elfin, a little elfin bale garden. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, you always then put, drop it into a, a garden and probably later on, yeah, you know, yeah, that'd be kind of a, that'd be a neat way to to give a gift in a in a bale. But it, yeah, yeah, it might be a little messy at that point. But <laughs> yeah, uh, Lisa Erdos has a comment <clears throat> uh, on the helpline this year. We have had lots of veggie garden folks asking how to protect from critters because of the drought. So I started recommending that folks cage in their veggies, if they can, into a walk-in structure. I'd also like to add to, to that from my own experience that the size mesh that you use is really important because um, um, even a good size rat can squeeze through something that's half an inch and, and mice can get into something that's you know, even smaller than that. So like half inch or quarter inch mesh is really um, it, it is the only way to keep them out, but the structure, yeah. Yeah, I've seen, I know someone that has built, um, you know, he's even got his fruit trees, his dwarf fruit trees. He's just got a big walk-in structure, you know, with, mm -hmm. you know, wooden posts and, and the real fine um, mesh that you're talking about. So, and that, that would be wonderful. Then you wouldn't have to fuss with all the uh, trying to cover the strawberries, trying to deal with the yeah. zucchini. You could grow the watermelon, you know, I, that would be the way to go. I, you know, we thought about it. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, we're anyway, we, we, I don't know, I'm just thinking about it. You know, I don't want to have a permanent structure in the side yard and, you know, like for safety issues, the fire truck, I've had to come racing through the yard. I don't know issues, you know, Michael's a retired architect. So, you know, he's got all these safety issues about it, but, um, but that's the easiest way. If you can just walk in and it's all, you know, safe <laughs> from the critters. Yeah. Yeah. Stu, Stu Dolphin says, I, I have caught three rats this past week, not in my cage, but my walk-in cage worked. It, it is, however, an expensive option. Yeah, yeah. So once you have it, yeah. you've got it, yeah. Yeah, we have lots of uh, kudos to you. Um, excellent presentation. Nice job, great presentation. Thank you, Carolyn. Excellent presentation. <laughs> um, and um, uh, then we have another question. Uh, what do you do with the bales with the old straw? Well, a few things. Uh, offer it to family and friends, of course. Hey, I've got lots of straw if you need it, you know, partially decomposed. But um, I put it around plants as mulch. I put it in my bio stacks uh, as composting. I've got it, a pile of it still sitting in the corner, just ready for something else. So it's all, it all ends up going back into the garden in one form or another as compost or mulch on top. And another comment about uh, wire, Bruce Gorin says that uh, hardware cloth is the, is the best option. Uh, chicken wire is too soft and it has large holes. So another. Yeah, I agree with him on that. For hardware. I use that, that's what I use for the bottom, you know, um, underneath to like gopher proof yeah. somewhat, you know, I know gophers can come up and around, but I like, yeah, I like the nice, the stiffness of it and you can get it. I think mine was half inch, which um, I don't know, maybe for, for walls or fencing, you might, like you say, I don't know if there's a smaller gauge. Yes, but, um, a quarter, quarter inch gauge yeah. and it's, it's a lot easier to handle, so but, it, but it's not it. structurally as, as, as good. Well, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, lots more uh, kudos. Um, interesting project and great presentation, Carolyn from Victoria Applegate. Um, and um, Stu says that the, uh, the, the mesh that he uses uh, on his structure is half, half, a, half an inch. Half inch, okay. Half an inch, right. Oh, yep. okay, well, that's good to know because he's, yeah. he's keeping out the, yeah. the, the bad ones, yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah, so Lisa Erdo says, Carolyn, excellent scientific presentation. <laughs> See, I told you, putting that chart in, right? <laughs> well, yeah. we're supposed to get CEs, Amps. you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. Gotta make it CE worthy, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so. I think. Right, that, that looks like that's about it. Well, I think um, the, uh, we've talked about just opening it up. if. You know, people yeah, just, so, chat, just chat and say hi to each other. Um, I'll give it to Peggy, right? You're gonna yeah, let, let me just jump in here, Carolyn, and thank you for taking us on your adventure with straw bale gardening. I mean, thank goodness that you thought to photograph your experiment so that you could share it with us. And we look forward to hearing about your next adventure. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended today and support, you know, 
supporting our own master gardeners and sharing their gardens or their projects. Our next open garden will be a live in-person event at Del Maxwell's home in Portola Valley at the end of October. So stay tuned for more information about that. And if any of you are interested in sharing your garden or a project you're working on, please contact me because we'd love to hear about it and share it with our community. So let's open this meeting up and say hello for about 10 minutes or so. And I have, I just would like to pose a question for this group. How could we use a straw bale garden? What, what are you thinking about? I was thinking about, you know, schools that might have a black top and really mm -hmm. no place to dig and put a garden in. You could bring yeah. in a straw bale and yeah. uh, do it that way. What do you guys think? Maybe community gardens too, the same, mm -hmm. the same, same type of uh, situation where maybe the soil isn't good or there's constraints or people that don't want to bend over very much. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Anything else anybody wants to talk about? You can talk about anything. It was just an idea. Get people <laughs> chatting. You can change your view to gallery view too, if you'd like. You have to physically do that because once someone stops sharing their slides, it reverts um, to a different view. And if you want to see everyone, if you want, you um, can change the view up in your upper right-hand corner there where it says view. It's good to you see know, everybody. You know, I was gonna say one thing, um... I, so I'm in, I like the doing the book club, right? So we have a companion planning book for the upcoming September 30th, I think, book club meeting. And so, you know, I've heard of companion planting, but I don't really, and I know what some of the matchups are, but you know, the why behind it or whatever. And so I've been starting to read that book and I'm trying, I'm putting together my slide presentation and I'm putting, reading the book and I'm thinking, oh, you know, companion planning. I, I, I didn't think about it too much when I was doing the straw bales and a lot of, the straw bales are like containers, right? So some of the when and when you look at com, companion planting, a lot of the a lot of the companions is about the roots talking to each other or working with each other, and you know whether you're in a container or a straw bale, you know you don't have that same soil environment. So um, I don't know. I haven't I haven't got it processed yet. I'm still working my way through the new the book club, but that that whole companion planting and really taking a deep dive into it with which the book club's doing. Um, it's just making me rethink all of the gardening things I do and how I do it and could I do it better and 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 and, I, and I'm also thinking with the straw bales you know maybe I should have put anyway I don't know if other people think about the companion planting or to what degree but I think it's uh, that, that that book clubs uh, it's still not too late you can buy an e an electronic copy of the book and it's it's pretty uh 